So I'd like to show you a device that can both be used to demonstrate uh, some of the stuff we've been learning about with uniform circular motion, and we're also going to be able to use to do a lab with. Uh, so this is called the Whirly Gig device. I'll be a little closer to the camera for this. So the, uh, it has a few parts. One is that it has a uh, one mass that is, uh, it doesn't need to be super big, but it needs to be more massive than the other parts of the system. Uh, that is connected to a string, uh, and uh, the string we want to be as close to massless and frictionless as possible, so a smooth, lightweight string. Um, and that is going to go through a handle. Uh, and the reason we want our string to be frictionless is because we want the string to be able to slide freely through that handle. And so the handle should also be nice and frictionless. And then the other end of the string is attached to a smaller mass. So, if we start off uh, with our two objects just like this, uh, this is like a really, really crude pulley system. Uh, we know that uh, they're both going to have a force of gravity pulling down on them uh, when I let go. Uh, but the, the larger mass is going to have a larger force of gravity, and so the net force on our system uh, is going to cause the little mass to go up and the uh, heavier mass to go down. So we'll just verify that happens. Okay, so that's not surprising. Um, if I start the little mass out here, uh, this really shouldn't change anything. This will want to sort of swing down uh, at first, um, but we would still expect that the uh, heavier mass or the larger mass is going to fall downwards and uh, the little mass is going to get pulled in towards the pipe. And so we can verify that happens. Okay. Um, but what if this object was moving in the first place? So I'm going to take this big mass off for a second. And imagine you have a top view. So imagine that our object is going, uh, it's just moving, going in a straight line. And we know that objects in motion want to remain in motion at a constant velocity. Uh, and so if this doesn't have the big mass pulling on it, uh, it would normally just want to go in a straight line, which would cause the string to get longer and longer and longer as this goes in a straight line away from it. Um, and so on its own, if we, instead of just, you know, releasing it from rest, if we had this spinning in a circle, I'm hanging on to the string right now, but if, I, if we have this spinning in a circle, uh, it wants to uh, get further and further away from the handle. And so if I let go of the string, we can see that's exactly what happens. So what happens if we uh, connect the two? Uh, if we have our large hanging mass uh, and we have our mass uh, spinning, our, our smaller mass spinning on the top. So let's see what that does. So we've got two competing factors here. Uh, we know as this pulls down, uh, that is going to cause there to be some tension in the string uh, that pulls this object, the little object, towards the center. And so, as this is trying to go in a straight line, um, if the force is big enough, uh, it will still win. And the object won't get to keep going in a straight line. Uh, it'll pull the object towards the center, and if the force is big enough, it'll eventually pull it all the way in. Uh, but instead of going in a straight line, uh, it'll make sort of a spiraling path, because this will already have been in motion. And so it'll continue going around, show it like this way, uh, as it spirals in and lines up. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, if our mass is not big enough, uh, so there's not enough force of gravity pulling on the string, uh, the object won't quite be able to go in a straight line, but it will be able to get further and further away from the pipe, and it will spiral outwards, like this. But if the mass is just right, so that the force of gravity is just right, so that for the speed this thing is moving at, uh, the force towards the center uh, causes uh, the object to go in a straight line, but to curve in towards the center, and it curves at the right rate, uh, it will go in a circle. Um, and so that would be uh, if we have everything exactly right, everything balanced perfectly, uh, have the exact right amount of force on everything, uh, we should be able to get uniform circular motion out of this. But that requires the, you can either think of it as having the little mass to be going at the right speed based on what the big mass is, or it requires the big mass uh, to be the correct mass for how fast the little mass is going. Either one is okay. So, 
Let's take a look. If Uh, we try to go in a circle, but that circle is too slow. I let go of my string. This just falls down to the bottom, and this isn't going in a circle anymore. If, on the other hand, this is going too fast. Okay, so we wind up with the uh, mass getting actually pulled upwards um, because this was going so fast that it actually uh, winds up winning and is able to move outwards. But if we are going at exactly the right speed, we can find a stable condition in the middle. Um, and so this must mean that the tension being provided on the spinning mass going in a circle must be exactly the right amount to provide that centripetal force that we need to make it go in a circle. Uh, based on the speed it is going at and the mass of that small object. And if this is not moving, that must mean that the tension in the string is also exactly the right amount of force to prevent this from moving up or down. Uh, and we can see that depending on the speed we're going at, there are different stable positions. So if I want to have a smaller circle, so if I want uh, a smaller radius here, there's a speed that's stable for that. If I want to have a larger radius, so it's going out, I can't, I don't know how easy this, well this is showing up, so my radius is out to about here. There's a different speed that's stable for that. I can go out even further. So now it's almost arm length now, I can make a bigger circle. Uh, and for this radius circle, there is a particular speed uh, that makes the system be stable. So uh, for the lab, uh, what we would do uh, is we would want to measure uh, a bunch of different stable conditions. Um, now the thing is we can't measure the speed directly because I don't have like radar guns available for everyone. And so the things that we actually can measure uh, is the radius of the circle while it's spinning. It's a little tricky to measure. Uh, it is easier with a lab partner. I'm not going to try to do it on my own. Uh, but if you have a couple people, you can figure out uh, what the radius of this circle is. Uh, the easier way to do it, rather than measuring from the center out to the spinning thing, uh, is to know how long your string is and just figure out how much is hanging down. And then you can figure out what the radius has to be. Uh, and then uh, the other thing we can measure, since we can't find the speed directly, is we can measure the period. We can figure out how much time it takes uh, for the object to go around in a circle. And I'm not sure if it's, I don't know if it's going so fast right now, whether you can see it or not. Um, but in real life, uh, you can usually make it out. Uh, and also, as I'm spinning this, I can also sort of feel when it comes around. And so I, if I had a stopwatch in my hand, uh, could time what the period is, figure out how long this takes to make one circle. Uh, and if we have that information, uh, if we have the radius and if we have the period, that should be enough to uh, figure out uh, everything, because those, those are our only two variables. Everything else, everything else stays the same. The speed is based on those, and the speed can be calculated based on those. This hanging mass, that stays constant. Um, the only things that are really changing um, is either you could think of it as the radius of the circle and the speed of the circle, or the radius of the circle and the period of rotation, uh, which is directly tied to the speed. Um, and so we should be able to collect a bunch of data uh, for uh, what radius we have when the circle is stable and what period that is associated with. And that's something we can easily collect with just meter sticks and stopwatches. Uh, so we get a whole bunch of radiuses and a whole bunch of corresponding periods uh, for uh, stable situations where we're able to have uniform circular motion for our small um, and then we can use that actually uh, to uh, figure out a bunch of things. Um, in this particular lab, what we're going to do is we're actually going to use it to measure the gravitational field strength, so the free fall acceleration due to gravity. Um, you can imagine this lab would work differently on different planets. If you did this on the moon, gravity wouldn't be pulling down as hard on the hanging mass, and that would change the speed that this has to be going at uh, in order for the system to be stable. If we did this on Jupiter or some planet that has more uh, gravitational strength, gravity would be pulling down harder on this, and that would also mean we'd have to be going at a different speed. And so the exact combination of radiuses and periods that we're going to get is actually going to be specific to Earth. 
And so if we can figure out what the relationship is between all of the different parts of this, the radius, uh, the period of rotation, uh, the amount of mass on each end here, uh, and the uh, g uh, for the Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared, uh, if we can figure out what that relationship is, we should be able to figure out a way to make a graph with our only two variables, the only two things that are changing, the radius and the period, uh, and use that uh, to figure out G, which is what our goal is.